All right, I'm going to get started, and we're talking about chimney swifts. And chimney swifts are migratory birds that spend their winter months in South America, and then they fly back primarily to the eastern half of the United States and Canada in the spring. Um, they usually start arriving in my area in Virginia just about now. Actually, they started arriving last week, and, um, and that's why I decided to, to talk about them uh, this week. I think it's a timely subject. Um, so this illustration shows the migratory patterns. They start out in, in South America, in Peru during the winter, and you can see the purple area is areas where they go um, during the spring and summer. Uh, mostly the eastern half uh, of the United States and up into Canada. And eBird um, is a website that tracks all kinds of bird uh, travels, not just chimney sweeps or, or chimney swifts. And you can see that. Um, a few more people have showed up. I got to get them going. Okay. Um, they started showing up in my area uh, last week. You can see some dates April 8th, April 9th. Uh, they started showing up in our area. Okay, so chimney swifts, um, they have a length of about five inches, a wingspan of about 12 inches. They weigh uh, about one, uh, one ounce and they have a gray to bluish black color. And they love to fly. Um, they spend most of their day flying and hunting and they're great for, uh, for the environment and they consume about a third of their body weight each day in insects. So, uh, so they're great little birds. Um, and then at night they roost primarily in chimneys. Uh, that's why they get called chimney swifts. Um, a unique thing about chimney swifts is they cannot stand up or perch and they must fly or cling to vertical surfaces. Uh, they started their life uh, in hollow trees and as those kind of gave way, they adapted to living inside of chimneys. Um, you will never see a chimney swift like sitting on a tree branch or sitting on a telephone wire. They just don't do that, they can't stand up. Um, this picture shows a pretty typical uh, chimney swift nest. Uh, as far as I know, always in masonry chimneys. I've never seen one in a factory built chimney. Uh, if anybody's got any pictures of chimney swift nest in a factory built chimney, I'd love to see them. Um, but uh, they're Typically, we find them just above the smoke chamber in the flue, uh, and they're usually six to seven inches across in kind of a half oval shape. Uh, and here's another one. And there will only be one active chimney sweep, uh, swift nest per chimney. They usually project two to three inches out from the wall. And uh, they use, when they're building their nest, a gluey saliva to attach little twigs to the chimney wall and they just keep adding them and adding them, building their, their nest structure. Um, and then uh, they keep building it even after uh, they've laid some eggs in there, they keep expanding it to prepare for the new uh, babies. And then once the baby eggs hatch, they start working on uh, gathering food. Uh, 
Uh, chimney swifts uh, generally mate for life and the mated pairs will return to the same site each year. So uh, once you get um, a chimney swift in your chimney, they're coming back uh, and they're gonna come back each year unless you do something to prevent it, like putting up a chimney cap. Uh, so that's something you can let your customers know. And they, the both the male and the female uh, share duties to uh, basically sit on the eggs and stay with the young and collect food for the babies once they're born. So a typical nest will contain three to five eggs as most common, could be as many as seven. They have an 18 to 21 day incubation period and uh, the female lays an egg every other day once she starts and the eggs are about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And again, you can see a typical nest with a few eggs in it. And once they're born, uh, they're born blind, naked, and helpless. And it takes about three days for the uh, feather tracks to appear. Uh, in 10 days, uh, they'll start getting feathers. And in about two weeks, their eyes will open up. Then around 20 days, they begin flapping. And this is when you'll start getting calls from the uh, customers saying there's a racket going on in their chimney. Uh, in about three to four week period, they begin uh, flying around in the chimney, learning how to fly. And uh, it's a very noisy time. Uh, you know, you've got dogs barking at the hearth. Customers are going crazy. Um, and so uh, this is when the calls start coming in. They'll usually take their first flights outside of the chimney at about four weeks to a month. And these young birds can live up to 14 years. And and those birds will keep coming back to the same chimney each year unless you do something to stop them. <clears throat> so no chimney or tower will contain more than one active nest regardless of size. Uh, but large chimneys or towers can become roost where non-mated uh, swifts spend the night. And you can have hundreds of these birds roosting in a chimney. It's really quite an amazing sight to see them. Uh, the swifts will be flying around all day, gathering insects and food and so forth. And then right about dusk, they all return to the roost. And if you have one of these roosts in your area, it actually becomes almost like a tourist attraction. People gather with their lawn chairs and their uh, wine to have a drink and watch the uh, the chimney swifts return to the chimney. It's really quite interesting where these roosts occur. So chimney swifts are a protected species and we can get big fines for messing with them. So if you encounter an active nest, do not disturb it. And the active period is typically April to August. So customers are going to be calling you, uh, complaining about the noise coming from their chimney, uh, a lot of loud screeching noise. Customers often call and say they've got bats in their chimney and that the noise is driving them and their pets crazy and they want them out of there. So when you start getting these calls, you might mention to the customers when you're talking to them on the phone, 
that it's likely they're chimney swifts and that we can't disturb them. Um, and you could schedule them for a visit in September after the chimney swifts have left. And at that point, obviously the chimney needs to be clean. You need a good inspection. And if they don't want them to return, they need to cap the chimney. Otherwise they're coming back next year. And for technicians in the field, we certainly need to, uh, to recognize uh, the appearance of the chimney swifts in their nesting. And I recommend forward scheduling um, an appointment for, you know, after Labor Day and recommend a chimney cap for them. Uh, but don't mess with them. There's been a lot of chimney guys have gotten some big fines for disturbing, uh, disturbing the chimney swifts. So uh, for the customer, a couple of options, return in the fall, clean the chimney, remove the nest. Um, if they're having a lot of noise that's driving them crazy, you can help them with that. A couple of uh, things you can do. Uh, we've packed the firebox full of insulation uh, and put a board up in front of there to cut down on the noise uh, so that, you know, we can try and help the customer without a start disturbing the birds because, again, big fines. Um, and as far as we know, chimney swifts do not carry histoplasmosis, which is a dangerous uh, disease normally found in, in dry bird dung. Um, some areas are getting into conservation and uh, have built chimney swift towers. Uh, many of you have uh, traveled to the tech center in Plainfield. Uh, there's a chimney swift tower there. Uh, we have one built at uh, our office in Chesapeake. Uh, so that just gives them an alternative uh, nesting area that doesn't disturb anybody. And there's, if you Google chimney swift towers, you can, you know, find plans on the internet if you want to build one. Here's some resources uh, for a lot of chimney swift information. If you want to learn more about chimney swifts, uh, they're pretty cool birds. They're good for the environment. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, wanted to just talk about chimney swifts because it's timely uh, with spring going on. Um, okay, I see Jerry's got a question there. Let me. My mic's off. Can you hear me, Jim? Yeah, we can hear you, Jerry. Okay, two questions. Number one, that's the first time I've heard that histoplasmosis was not carried by chimney swifts. And number two, how many documented cases do you know of of sweeps being fined or held accountable for swift removal? Do we have any stats on that? I, I don't have numbers. I've definitely heard of it. Um, uh, and like on the chimney, uh, chimney swifts.org, uh, site, I saw some information about it, but I certainly don't have a number, Jerry. Um, it's, it's best just don't mess with the birds and, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're good for the, uh, you know, for the environment. Uh, there's no point in messing with them. The biggest thing is customers want them out of their chimney because during, you know, while, while the young are growing up and for the first month after they've hatched, they're just making a tremendous amount of racket. Okay. Um, that usually starts happening around June, at least in my area, we'd start getting those calls in June. They're showing up now. They'll start uh, building their nest. They're going to lay their eggs into uh, into May, and then in June and July is when they're going to be active and noisy in the chimney. What about the histoplasmosis? Like I said, that's the first time I've heard of chimney swifts not carrying that. 
Well, um, I know I encountered that when I was doing some of the research for this. So um, I found that uh, stated somewhere. Right. So all birds do not carry that issue or is it just chimney swifts? Uh, not all birds do. I think it varies with the species. Yeah, because we've taught it for years that histoplasmosis came from that. That I said that was the first time I've heard that. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so our next three weeks on Tech Talk, and again, we'll be here at, on Tuesday morning, seven thirty Eastern. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about heat illness. Uh, the following week, prevention of heat illness, and then on May fifth we'll talk about a heat illness safety plan and I've got some cool resources to share with you for that. So um, anyway, that's kind of the uh, end of my formal presentation. I'm gonna uh, just open it up for any questions now. Stop sharing my screen here. There's my contact information if I can ever help you guys. Uh, give me a call, send me an email. Um, so now, um, are there any questions? I just unmuted everybody. Um, so let's see, we got Jerry. I see Kevin Fox um, had hi. a question. Hi, hi Jim. Um, good morning. You said there was hefty fines. Do you and have any idea is it five hundred dollars ten thousand dollars or what are you hearing uh ten thousand dollars is uh is the standard fine but you know they the conservation officer always has the option to to modify those but i think ten thousand is the maximum fine okay thank you certainly not worth gambling with so um, hey jim Hey, Diane. Hey, now let's say you find them and you say don't mess with them. Putting a cap on would basically be messing with them? Yeah, because if you put a, a cap over an active nest, you're going to basically starve them out. They're not gonna be able to get out of the chimney to, uh, to go gather food and, and support the babies. Okay, just wanted clarity on that of what messing yep. with the bird is. Yeah, don't yeah, don't cap the chimney or disturb the nest while there's eggs in it or while there's a family living in it. Okay. Um hey, um great turnout this morning and uh and I appreciate everybody coming. I hope you found this uh helpful. I uh, don't want to make it too long. I know everybody's got to get to work. But uh, again, um, these, these recordings will be available on my YouTube channel fairly soon. Um, and you can use them at any point for uh, company training meetings or what have you. So uh, any other questions out there before we go? I guess not. Well, um, thank you all for coming to my uh, first Tech Talk session. I enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Everybody have a great day, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jim. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks, Jim. All right.